for the moment, I'm trying to tell you something about um, what I do as a cancer researcher and uh, what, what kind of progress we've made against cancer, what some of the problems are, and to tell you a little bit about myself because my own career is a little odd and I thought you might want to know a little bit about who's speaking. Um, we, once I tell you that, I will outline what I see as three phases of understanding cancer. And in those three segments, I'd be happy to take questions. So my name is Harold Varmus. Uh, I came late to science. I started as a reader. I was a, a, an English literature student at Amherst College. I wrote a thesis on Charles Dickens. I edited the school newspaper. I went to graduate school in English for a while. Then I decided to go to medical school, which had always been my life's destiny, according to neighbors and family. And uh, <laughs> at medical school, I found that I loved medicine, but didn't really want to practice it. Uh, I had to uh, make a choice during the Vietnam War whether I wanted to go to jail, Canada, or the NIH. Fortunately, the NIH took me in, and while I was there, I fell in love with basic science and uh, working on a, on a uh, difficult but interesting problem uh, in bacterial gene regulation. I wanted to go back to something that was more related to medicine, which was something I knew, and I found a niche in cancer research. In those days, cancer research was a very diverse and not very productive activity, not usually recommended to people who had aspirations in science. But I knew that there were some viruses that occurred in animals ranging from chickens to mice to cats and a few other animals that were capable of turning a normal cell into a cancer cell and causing tumors in animals. In those days, there was no molecular cloning, there were no, there were no genome projects, there was no recombinant DNA, uh, and it was very difficult to try to identify uh, the mechanisms by which cancers might arise. People like me, for reasons you'll hear in just a moment, uh, believed that genes were at the root of cancer, um, that uh, there were many other things we needed to understand about cancer, but, but that knowing the genetic origins would be important. And it seemed to me the one simple way to approach the question was to use these little packets of protein and DNA or RNA called viruses and try to sort out from viruses that carry only a few genes what genes might be sufficient to change a normal complex mammalian or avian cell into a cancer cell. So I chose to work on cancer viruses and did so at the University of California, San Francisco for over 20 years, made some advances, a couple of which you'll hear about during the course of the body of this talk. Um, but then I took a strange turn uh, as a scientist and became more involved in, in uh, government work and ran the National Institutes of Health for six years, then came back and ran the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center for a decade, then went back to the, to, to the NIH to run the National Cancer Institute for five years, and now I have a posi position at the Meyer Cancer Center at Weill Cornell Medicine, and also work at the New York Genome Center. Now, all this, in all this time, I've remained a working scientist. It wasn't so easy to keep both parts of my life going, uh, including some family life, but it was possible to do that. Uh, and uh, I just arrived a few minutes ago from the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on uh, uh, themed targeting cancer, so my head is full of new information very little of which I'll impart here today to your relief. Um, but uh, I do want to give you the sense that although my life has been one of uh, running scientific institutions for the last 20 some years, a little different from most of the scientists you've been hearing about, um, I have kept a pretty active oar in the waters of, of cancer biology. Let me just say a word or two about cancer as a general problem in, for medicine and for biology. Cancer is of course, a major problem in public health. There are roughly seven and a half million deaths every year from cancer worldwide. That number is going up. There are roughly a half a million in the US. Uh, it is a huge problem in global health, not just in uh, health of people living in advanced economies. Uh, the disease is the, perhaps the most prominent of what we call diseases of the genome, influenced by inherited abnormalities in DNA to a limited extent, but a real extent that we'll return to in a moment, uh, very strongly influenced by mutations that occur 
during an individual's lifetime. Those mutations and other changes in the way genes are regulated can affect how a cell behaves. And it's the constellation of many different abnormalities, mutations, and changes in gene expression that account for the altered behavior of cells when they become malignant. Cancers are manifest by the appearance of a growth, a tumor, at any one of many sites in the body. Different sites have different rates of uh, tumor occurrence, and tumors behave differently at different sites. And we can explain some of that difference by noting that every cancer is different at the genetic level. However, there are a lot of commonalities, and we'll begin to explore some of those in just a moment. Uh, but as you know, this is a huge burden to society. It's also an enormous challenge to those of us who are trying to understand how normal cells work and how they become uh, functionally abnormal. And that's among the things I'll be exploring. So, um, see if this is gonna work. So here is what I've just told you. Um, I add on to that that uh, I will be focusing to a very large extent on what we call cancer genes, the genes that are abnormal in cancer. Some of those work in a positive fashion, that is they contribute to the, to the generation of a cancer by driving a cancer to, uh, to, to driving cancer cells to grow abnormally, but they're also, and they're, those are called oncogenes, and they're also genes that normally are involved in keeping a cell from behaving uh, in a cancerous way. Those are called tumor suppressor genes. I'll have less to say about that. And as indicated, there are many clinical and biological problems here, a few of which I'll be able to touch on in the course of this hour. So um, what I'm gonna try to do is divide this into three modules, which I think is convenient for the digital viewing as well. Uh, the first, the longest, will set up the clinical and scientific problem in a little more detail than I've just outlined. Uh, the second will tell you something about what we're now thinking when we think about how to approach one part of the effort to control cancer, namely treatment. And the third will be um, uh, an effort to give you some idea about how the scientific community and the clinical community, which are increasingly merged these days, uh, are trying to overcome some of the frustrations that we've encountered in trying to deal with cancer in a simple, rational way. Now, I need to remind you that cells in the body are very different in character. They're are at least 200 to 300 well-known different cell types in the body. And if you look more carefully at how those cell types develop, there are actually many more in every one of the so-called lineages that are found in every, every organ in our body. So these are there's a collection of cells that all look somewhat different. Uh, and as you might imagine, some of these do become cancers, some do not. Um, and uh, of course they make they're very different in character, and they make very different kinds of cancer. Here are some examples of what cancers look like under a microscope. This is a cancer of the colon. Here's a cancer that has spread from its primary site uh, through the body and to uh, grow in the liver. Uh, here's an example of, of uh, abnormal cells, of leukemic cells growing in the blood. And I just show you these not to go into the detail of, an, of a pathological Diagnos diagnosis, but just to give you some sense of how diverse uh, cancers can appear, either in a, in a, in a so-called gross anatomy section or under the microscope. Now, cancers occur and have occurred at different incidents in different organs of the body, and those changes in incidence are often reflections of uh, the, the habits of a society. So the, the red line that's so prominent here shows the uh, the incidence of, of uh, death from lung and bronchial cancer in men over the last uh, 85 years or so. And you can see a dramatic increase from pre-World War, pre -World War II days uh, to a very high incidence reflecting one thing, that is the use of, of tobacco as a, a, for, for uh, smoking. And um, with a decline that occurred um, some 20 or 30 years after it was recognized by the Surgeon General that smoking was bad for your health. Uh, very similar data for women, which I'm not going to have time to look at, but you also see the decline in a number of other cancers, for example, cancer of the uterus, which declined because we began to detect abnormal cells with pap smears, 
So not all of this is reflection of, uh, of, uh, of habits. And overall, it's useful to remember that, that since, uh, for the last 25 or 30 years, cancer rates, cancer death rates have been declining by about 1.5% overall every year. Uh, heart disease has had a much more dramatic decline in incidence when adjusted for age. Heart disease is still the leading cause of death in the U.S. Uh, how do we take care of, how do we prevent and take care of cancers? I'll come to this in a minute, but um, uh, there are many ways in which cancer can be controlled, and I think it's useful to keep this in the back of your minds while we're thinking about the science of, of, uh, of cancer and how cancer arises. So cancer can be controlled by preventing it, and one way to prevent it is to think about what it is that causes mutations, um, and uh, I'll come to that in a little more detail in just a moment. Um, a second way to prevent it is to um, identify um, people who are at high risk, for example, people who carry mutations that predispose to cancer, and try to um, find ways to protect them from either cancer-causing insults, uh, things that cause mutations, or by, in some cases, removing organs like ovaries that may be at high risk of cancer. Uh, a second way to try to prevent death from cancer is to find cancer early, and we do that through um, uh, uh, so-called screening procedures. Those exist for a few types of cancer, and they can be incredibly effective and are responsible, for example, for the decline of death and for the incidence of, of, uh, of colorectal cancer by using colonoscopy and, dete and detection of blood in, in um, and fecal, fecal samples. Uh, when we approach, when we think about treatment of cancer, uh, we're thinking largely um, uh, about removal. That's the most effective means, and that's done traditionally by surgery. But when cancer has spread beyond its primary site and caused metastatic disease, or when it occurs in the bloodstream and can't be removed by surgery, then we have to think about other other approaches, and those include the use of of cell damaging drugs, so-called chemotherapies, uh, and, and some for solid tumors and some uh, other blood tumors by radiotherapy. But uh, what I'll be telling you about are new ways to think about cancer and treatment of cancer that are based largely on understanding how cancer arises and what kinds of genetic change mediate uh, the, the alteration of behavior from uh, a normal set of behaviors to a more, um, a, a more abnormal set. But we think about cells as having a nucleus and a cytoplasm and uh, growing only when it's appropriate for that cell to grow for the function of the organ in which it resides. Every cell in the body comes from a series of precursors. I'm not gonna draw too many of them, but uh, uh, suffice to say that there is at the top of that hierarchy something we call a stem cell. And a stem cell has the property that when it divides, it generates one daughter cell that's like itself and another cell that is more advanced. Uh, so there's a stem cell. It divides um, and recapitulates itself, but also uh, undergoes growth or can begin to differentiate into the more mature cell I was describing here. And cells can also go through a process called programmed cell death in which cells are eliminated. And it is perturbations of mainly of these three phenomena that have a major role in generating a cancer because when a cell grows too often, divides, divides too frequently, um, or when a cell um, uh, fails to differentiate, or when a cell fails to undergo cell death, that organ will have more cells than it normally would. And um, that is a, an essential feature of what, of the kinds of biological phenomenon, uh, which when perturbed by, um, by various genetic events and other gene regulatory events, can produce a cancer. Let's think a little bit about how uh, the mutations that I've talked about earlier actually occur within the context of developing a cancer. So at the top of this chart uh, is a normal cell, which becomes what we call a founding clone in a cancer because it undergoes a mutation. And then it it will grow and accumulate more mutations and uh, will end up being what we call a clone in which every cell has the initial mutation and additional mutations occur as well. And that group of cells is found in 
the, the lung tumor, uh, and sometimes will spread to other sites in the body, like brain, bone, or liver. So I want to tell you a little bit about how mutations might occur, because that affects the way we think about, about cancer. Um, and there are basically three ways in which one's cells may have mutations. First, you might inherit a mutation that predisposes to cancer from one of your parents. That happens um, probably at reasonable frequency uh, with, in the case of, of genes that have a, confer a very low risk of cancer. But there are some genes, some of which are probably familiar to you, genes called BRCA1 for breast cancer 1, breast cancer 2, um, and a few other genes that I won't name, uh, that when inherited for one reason or another, because they affect a tumor suppressor gene, a gene that protects your cells against cancer, or because they affect the fidelity with which your, your cells reproduce the DNA and repair it, uh, they end up predisposing, predisposing someone to a high incidence of cancer. The second way in which your genes may undergo mutation is because you were exposed to a number of environmental influences that are mutagenic. One might be the UV radiation you get from sunlight when you're lying on the beach in Australia and exposing yourself um, to the damage that UV radiation does to your DNA. A second would be, uh, as a common example, the so-called mutagens that are present in cigarette tars that we know uh, induce certain kinds of mutations in our DNA and account for a large number of cancers, but especially cancer of the lung. The third way in which these um, mutations might occur is something that people tend not to know about, and that is because the DNA duplication process that must work every time any one of our cells divides is not perfect. Um, this is a movie made by a remarkable uh, illustrator named Drew Barry in Australia, uh, who has been uh, trying to let us visualize uh, what happens in our cells when they undergo uh, normal biological events. In this case, the, the replication, of the copying of DNA, which you're seeing coming up from the left, is a double-stranded uh, uh, representation of, of, of DNA. Uh, two strands are being separated by a series of proteins. The proteins are shown as these fuzzy balls of blue and green. And the remarkable thing here is that uh, this, this little machine of proteins is able to separate the strands and begin to copy both strands in an appropriate way. Um, but as you might imagine, this is, this is, by the way, the speed at which this process occurs. And every one of those little yellow projections is one of those uh, famous bases, A, C, T, or G. Um, and uh, when things are carried out at this pace, as you might imagine, uh, mistakes are made at a very low frequency. Uh, perhaps one in a million, one in a hundred million, um, but, uh, uh, and there are correction mechanisms to fix some of the mistakes, but nevertheless, when our DNA is copied, when our chromosomes are separated into daughter cells, mistakes do get made, uh, not always corrected, and um, that is one of the sources of, of error that, uh, um, that can contribute to the development of a cancer. Now, what do those, muta those mutations look like? Well, um, the most commonly envisioned change is a change in which uh, a single uh, nucleotide in our DNA, uh, such as um, what's outlined here, is, is a position in a region of DNA that encodes for protein. Most folks in this room probably know that when we encode for protein, protein is made of amino acids. There are roughly 20 amino acids that are placed in proteins. Uh, every triplet of uh, nucleotides in DNA encodes a single amino acid. So change in one of those triplets, CCG, in this case changing to CTG, sorry, GTC, um, makes a change in the amino acid that's found at that position. This is the kind of mutation that is most commonly encountered in cancer, in most kinds of cancers in human beings. Um, but uh, um, there are other kinds of changes, such as this change, a gross change, in which uh, instead of seeing the normal 23 pairs of chromosomes, which are lit up here by using um, molecular probes that are color-coded for each chromosome to allow us to envision all 23 pairs of chromosomes, uh, but in many cancer cells, the constitution of chromosomes is highly varied. Abnormal 
kinds of chromosomes, abnormal numbers of chromosomes, and those represent uh, defects that occur because uh, chromosomes undergo rearrangements, and when they're divided into daughter cells, uh, the wrong number of chromosomes may appear in one or two of the, of the daughter cells from every cell division. Now, um, so here is the slide that should have preceded what I said before. Uh, three of the three things we just talked about. This is, I guess, a little review for you uh, of the three kinds of ways in which, in which um, uh, mutations might occur. Identifying environmental factors that might be causative agents in cancer is a very tricky business. Um, there's no doubt there are environmental factors that influence cancer. One, I've mentioned a few already. One is simply smoking a cigarette. Uh, another would be exposure to asbestos, which is a known mutagen. Uh, another would be exposure to certain viruses, which we know uh, can carry genes that, that have, that have uh, cancer-causing properties. Taking a single chemical and testing it for um, its cancer-causing abilities is not a simple matter and has led to a lot of confusion and, to my mind, a, a lot of fear. Um, when a chemical clearly causes mutation in a variety of, of species uh, and the mutation, mutations occur at uh, the kinds of concentrations that human beings might be exposed to, uh, it is appropriate to put that onto a list of probable or likely or even certain uh, carcinogens, depending on the, the degree of, of, of validity. There is a lot of suspicion out there about, uh, about so-called contaminants in our environment, um, uh, ranging from cell phones to um, things that might be, as you say, in laundry detergent. Um, and many of these claims have very, very little validity. Uh, there are claims about different kinds of foods being um, uh, risk conferring for cancers. In general, those risks are very, very hard to document. And um, I would just leave it at that, that, that all the, the uh, international agency that oversees these problems or the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences is able to do is to put such markers on a list of possible, probable, or certain carcinogens. And uh, but I think that as we look at cancer rates around the world, the things we ought to be concentrating on the things that really stand out: exposure to UV, certain viruses, and smoking, and uh, obvious industrial contaminants like asbestos. It's really I can't give you quantitative answers at this point, but it's very likely that mutations are occurring in cells all the time. We have some reason to believe that when a, when a cell becomes a cancer cell as a result of cancer-causing mutations, it has already experienced other mutations that either have no effect on the behavior of the cell, for example, mutations that occur in some region that doesn't even encode a protein or doesn't influence the regulation of genes, but just mutations that occur because copying DNA is complicated. But there are probably other mutations which might give, give a cell a slight advantage if another more powerful mutation occurs. And one of the great new innovations in biology is the ability to study single cells, not, not whole tumors or clusters of cells, but individual cells and begin to develop some picture of the evolutionary process by which one cell becomes a cancer as a result of mutations that actually change the behavior of cells. Most likely, in most cases, multiple mutations are required for a cancer to arise. And um, but we, we will know over the course of the next several years exactly how that happens. One confounding feature is the, uh, the, the, the fact that there are many different cell types in the body, and we already have pretty good reason to believe that not all of those cell types will be um, susceptible to the cancer-causing effects of certain mutations. In other words, some genes will work as cancer genes in some cell types and not others. Even when we think about the cells that are, that are members of a lineage that go from an organ stem cell to the mature, highly differentiated cells in, a, in an organ, uh, and sorting out which mutational events are 
most likely to change the behavior of a cell at different steps in, in uh, the, the development of uh, a mature cell in any organ from its stem cell, I think will be very instructive in, in thinking about how, how best to prevent cancer and how to detect it. Um, but I want to stop now and, and tell you a little bit about how, um, how uh, cancer genes, the actual genes that are affected by these mutations, were discovered, uh, just to give you some sense of the process of discovery in, in this field. Uh, and uh, the first uh, of those discoveries is one that I was myself involved in. You recall that I told you that when I was a slip of a child, age 30, and decided to spend my life doing research rather than reading books or or, or studying medicine or practicing medicine, uh, I decided to work on tumor viruses, and I chose to work primarily on a cancer virus known as Rouse sarcoma virus, or RSV. And that virus, which had been discovered in 1910 by a man named Rouse who worked here in New York City at the Rockefeller Institute, um, was a virus found in chickens, and a chicken that uh, carried a cancer called a sarcoma. And um, over the course of many years, without the kinds of tools that we had uh, beginning in the 1950s and 60s, uh, it was really difficult to make much progress with this virus other than to put it into animals and see if it made a tumor. Uh, in the 1950s, it became possible to introduce the virus into cells growing in culture and to show that it would perturb the function or the behavior of those cells so that you could actually make a test for a tumor causing capacity of a virus in, uh, by infecting a cultured cell, simplifying the, the study of the virus. But it wasn't until we had some molecular tools uh, that uh, it was possible to begin to try to answer that question of why and how uh, a virus with only a few genes uh, might be competent to change the, the, the function of a cell. And if we look first at the bottom line of this diagram, that is uh, a crude uh, molecular biologist uh, effort to depict in the simplest possible form uh, the piece of RNA in this virus that carries all of its genetic information, its so-called genome. The first three genes, which we won't talk about, although they're incredibly important, are in required to uh, produce the factors that allow this virus to grow. And this virus is a member of a family you've probably heard about, the retrovirus family, which includes HIV, a virus that wasn't, wasn't heard of in the 1970s when this work was being done. Uh, but uh, understanding what those genes do proved to be critical later on for, uh, for trying to confront the crisis presented to the world by the emergence of the disease known as AIDS. But the fourth gene in this linear depiction of a very simple genome of a virus is called SARC for sarcoma, because this virus was able to make the tumor we call sarcomas. Uh, and it had been shown by people using some simple genetic tricks that if you made mutations in the virus, either the kinds of mutations I've been telling you about, point mutations, a change of a single nucleotide, or more extensive changes, like deletions of the gene, that those viruses would lose their ability to transform cells. So the mutations defined a region of the genome that was uh, that became called the, the SARC gene, the viral SARC gene, because it, it conferred upon the virus the ability to carry out um, malignant change of a cell in, in, in culture or in an animal. Among the mutations that have been generated in Rouse sarcoma virus was one that, that deleted the gene, the, uh, the gene that conferred the transforming power on the virus, the so-called SARC gene. And it was possible to use those two viruses, the, the wild-type virus and the deletion mutant, to make a probe that was specific for the viral transforming gene. And by using that region of the of the Rouse sarcoma virus genome, it was then possible to uh, look in normal cells to ask where the gene came from. It turned out that there was a normal gene, which came to be called the cellular SARC gene, which differed very, very slightly from the viral gene, but the differences were profound, and they accounted for the ability of the protein made by the, by the viral SARC gene 
but not the, the protein made by the cellular gene to cause a change in the behavior of cells. Now, I don't have time to talk in detail about that difference, but just put it this way. These genes, the, 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 the SARC gene that's present in a virus, like rouse sarcoma virus, and the SARC gene present in normal cells, make an enzyme. That enzyme is very tightly controlled in normal cells, but in the, in the virus particle, the gene has been altered in a way that unleashes the enzyme, so its, its activity is un, uh, undiminished by regulatory events. And the activity affects the way the cell behaves, and the way the cell interprets external signals, and the cell that's experiencing the brunt of the activity of that unleashed enzyme undergoes malignant change. So that was an important event because it led us to understand that genes present in these viruses and animals, at least the class that we call retroviruses, had been acquired by retroviruses that had pirated a normal gene from, uh, from, uh, from normal cells at some point in their history, and that subtle changes in those genes could render these genes competent to cause a cancer. Uh, and that raised a more general question of whether uh, these uh, genes of this kind might be more abundant than simply the SARC gene. And indeed, by using a large number of retroviruses found in chickens and mice and rats and monkeys and in cats, um, many of my colleagues depicted here uh, showed that, uh, that uh, these viruses contained many different kinds of genes, not just the SARC gene I've told you about, but a number of other genes that are labeled here, uh, including several that are particularly uh, hotly labeled with red ink uh, to um, uh, indicate genes that we know are mutated in human cancer. So retroviruses in the 1970s and early 80s provided an entry point into a, a menagerie of genes uh, that we think of now as cellular proto-oncogenes that have the ability to be changed by mutation in a way that renders them cancer-causing. And this was obviously a big step forward in the history of the study of cancer because it brought into our lives a lot of genes that, uh, that proved to be important in human cancer, gave us some ideas about how we might counteract the, the um, activities of these genes, uh, and uh, did all of that well, well before we had the tools available to analyze all of, a, of an animal cell or human genome. So this was a powerful step that allowed, uh, allowed scientists uh, like me and my colleagues depicted here uh, to make progress against cancer much earlier than would otherwise have been possible. Moreover, it turns out that most of these genes make proteins that are very interesting in the, the normal activities of normal cells. Uh, these genes make, make proteins that uh, act as signals going from one cell to another, as receptors that are sitting on the surface of a cell that, allow, that receive um, signals that are active between cells. They encode proteins that, that work to uh, transfer information along a chain of, of uh, signaling inside a cell. They encode proteins that work on the chromosome to control the way genes are expressed, that is read out to make RNA and protein. So uh, what we learn from retroviruses and the study of those viruses in the 70s and 80s was about a constellation of genes that proved to be important in human cancer, but also critical to many, many different aspects of cell behavior in general. You know, I think it's possible to say one molecule um, looks like another that we know to be mutagenic, but the only way I know of to be confident that something's mutagenic is to do a test for mutagenesis. It's not that difficult. Computational methods are essential to modern cancer research, and if anything, uh, when you envision the, the scientific ecosystem in which we now work uh, as uh, uh, people trying to build a world of precision medicine, the heart of that ecosystem is the computer, where information from thousands of different cancers uh, in which thousands of genes have been studied and found to be mutated are assembled and patterns are, are being, uh, being understood. So 
there's no doubt that computational methods have um, a increasingly dominant role in cancer research, but I think for the purpose of predicting um, mutational activity, there is uh, nothing better than actually doing the test. Because you don't have to do the test in a human being. You understand that. You, you, you can do it in, in, in animals, in cell culture, uh, even in ba simple bacteria. In fact, some of the most useful information about the relationship between mutagenesis and carcinogenesis comes from a test called the Ames test that was developed uh, in the 1960s to show using a simple bacterial strain that a compound would make bacterial mutations. And many of those compounds we know to have carcinogenic activity, and some of them have been excluded from industrial use as a result of those tests. Let me tell you briefly about another way to approach this question. Um, and this was a, an approach uh, taken um, perhaps most famously by Robert Weinberger, a colleague of mine in, in, uh, at M MIT, who reasoned that if we took a human cancer cell, it might already have a proto-oncogene that's been activated uh, by um, some kind of mutational event. And he took those human tumor cells, made uh, DNA from them, introduced them into a cell that behaved like a normal cell, and looked to see whether he would then introduce uh, a, 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 an activated oncogene that would um, cause um, a cell to behave like a cancer cell, a so-called transformed cell. And when he did that, uh, indeed, he could uh, find these uh, foci of abnormal cells and then study those cells in a way that allowed him to identify the gene that was present in the human tumor cells that was responsible for this activity assayed uh, in, in, in the way shown here. And the remarkable thing was that the so-called transforming genes that were transferred from those human cells into the normal appearing mouse cells in culture were very commonly uh, mutant forms of proto-oncogenes and including the kinds of proto-oncogenes I've been talking about, most particularly in this case, the so-called RAS gene. And that was determined um, at, even at that early stage in the 1980s by doing uh, DNA sequencing experiments that showed that um, human cancer cell that was used as a source of DNA was a, uh, a contained a gene that had undergone a so-called point mutation, the change of a single nucleotide in the DNA chain that uh, changed the nature of the protein that that gene encoded. And uh, strikingly, uh, the mutations found in the human cancer cell were the same as the differences between the viral version of the gene found in the retrovirus in which this gene was first isolated and the cellular gene. So it all sort of came together in a pretty exciting way. Now, um, that's history. And I'm going to tell you about some more recent events uh, that, uh, that make use of the kind of information I've been giving you that suggests that we've had uh, a lot of success in identifying uh, the nature of the genetic changes that underlie uh, cancer in human beings. Um, our ability to detect those mutations now is no longer dependent on tumor viruses the way it was 20 or 30 years ago, because now we're able to sequence human DNA from cancers uh, at an incredibly, frankly, an astonishing rate, um, so that uh, the National Cancer Institute and other parts of the NIH have now sequenced literally thousands of cancer genomes, entire genomes, or at least the entire coding sequence, protein coding sequence in those genomes, to list all of the mutations that are present in such cancers. Uh, and um, that has given rise to the concept that if we can analyze in detail uh, the cancers of, uh, of many different types and many different individuals, that we can design drugs and other th potential therapies uh, to um, treat cancer in a much more precise fashion than simply by giving them uh, cellular poisons that kill cells that undergo division. So how did we get there? Well, there was an intermediary step before uh, the, the advent of, of uh, sequencing part or all of, of a human genome to make decisions about cancer. That first case is an important one that I will use to illustrate the potential power of so-called precision therapy. So there's a disease in the US called chronic myeloid leukemia, um, which you may have heard of because it's a disease that some famous people, Abdul 
Kareem Jabbar, for example, has, uh, have, has experienced. Um, and uh, this so-called adult leukemia uh, is found in about 6,000 individuals each year. One characteristic of this disease, which was noted as early as 1960, is the presence of one of those abnormal chromosomes I told you about a few minutes ago. And that chromosome, which was first seen in a lab in Philadelphia, is not surprisingly called the Philadelphia chromosome. Uh, it has a, um, a very unusual property, which was apparent once the chromosome was studied in more detail. It represents the result of a fusion between human chromosome 22 and human chromosome 9. And the fusion always occurs at almost exactly the same point, and it brings together two genes, one of which we had already known about, the so-called ABLE gene, which is one of those genes on that slide that showed all my colleagues, one of which was uh, a, a colleague who had identified this gene because a slightly different version of it had occurred in a retrovirus that was able to cause cancer in animals. So we knew what that gene was and what it did, what kind of protein it made, and this fusion that occurs naturally uh, without any intervention by viruses in this disease, in virtually every case of leukemia, um, creates a, an enzyme not unlike the SARC enzyme that I described for you before, that has an unremitting activity, an uncontrolled activity uh, that uh, is responsible for the ability of this, of this uh, funny gene created by a chromosomal translocation to make cells divide in an unremitting fashion and to create this leukemia. So the, the next step that was very remarkable in this story was the identification of a, a small molecule, a, chemical, a small chemical, a drug that blocks the, the, the souped up version of this enzyme. And when that enzyme is inactivated, miraculously, most of the cancer cells die. Not every one, so this is not a cure, but very close to every one. Uh, this drug was quite rapidly developed, uh, approved after only a very short time because its effects were so dramatic, uh, and uh, it now restores a, a normal life expectancy to patients who have this disease. How does it look uh, under the microscope? Well, on the left, the two panels show the peripheral blood and the bone marrow from a patient who has leukemia, and you can see uh, some cells uh, up in the middle that are, are clearly abnormal, so-called leukemic cells. The bone marrow is dense with the very the most primitive cells uh, in the, in the blood-forming system. Uh, after even a week of treatment, but certainly after several months, uh, the blood picture is absolutely normal, and the bone marrow is also normal. Now, these individuals do have a few cells that continue to have the abnormal chromosome. If you stop the drug, which is in itself relatively non-toxic uh, and taken orally, uh, the disease will recur because we're blocking the activity and not every cell gets eliminated. Um, and there are a few patients in whom uh, resistance to the drug develops, but happily in this disease, we now have second line and even third line drugs that allow these patients to put their disease back into a remission. It's very rare to have someone die of this disease that was almost uniformly lethal within five years of diagnosis, even 20 years ago. So that's remarkable, and it gave rise to the kinds of thinking uh, that I just mentioned, that yes, we can do this for every cancer, we can find the right, uh, we define the molecular abnormalities, and we, can, and we can design drugs that will counter those abnormalities. Well, what I'm gonna tell you over the next five minutes is that life just isn't that simple. And one way to show how complicated it is by showing this slightly too complicated graph, but what's shown here along the horizontal axis is a set of different cancer types, um, various kinds of leukemias and tumors arising in a number of solid organs, some childhood cancers, some uh, cancers of adults, including some like lung cancer and melanoma uh, that, that are due to, uh, at least in part, to known mutagenic or carcinogenic agents like sunlight and, and cigarette smoking. Uh, and what's shown on the vertical axis is the number of mutations that have occurred during a lifetime affecting the, each of those uh, uh, cells in each of those tumor types. And those numbers can range up to 
uh, uh, a thousand or ten thousand mutations per cell. That's a lot of mutations. Hard to sort out uh, the kinds of mutations that are responsible for driving the the um, malignant behavior of the cell from those mutations that are simply along for the ride. Mutations that have occurred uh, because of exposure to mutagenic agents or because the cells are not repairing their DNA well, uh, and uh, um, and that creates an obvious problem. Moreover, the number of mutations per cancer varies. The kinds of mutation per cell per cancer varies. Uh, not every cell in the cancer is exactly the same set of mutations. There are some that are shared because they occurred early in the growth of the clone that made the cancer. But uh, the situation obviously is very complex. Let me illustrate that problem for you with, in the case of lung cancer, which is the most common form of cancer worldwide. Um, and in the US, it's one of the most, common, the most common cause of cancer death in the world. I told you something about lung cancer in relation to tobacco use. It was of interest that there are at least four different kinds of lung cancer. But if we begin to look at the mutations in these cancers, things look very different. We do have some drugs, as the theory of precision medicine would predict, against, uh, against some of these proteins. And that's terrific. But, but the the remissions that are induced by the use of those drugs are almost always temporary uh, because drug resistance becomes a huge problem. Um, so the next slide gives you some sense of, uh, by showing different tumors along the horizontal axis and different genes across the vertical axis. And you can see in a moment, each of those uh, colored uh, uh, short dashes represents a different kind of mutation. And you can see that every cancer is clearly different, different sets of mutations uh, in every tumor, and uh, different kinds of mutations affecting even the same gene. So this complexity is obviously uh, a serious problem. Now, if we begin to sort out which of these mutations are likely driving the malignant behavior of the cancer, then we can draw a little pie chart that indicates that uh, uh, some, of the, some of the mutations affect genes that we know about in some detail. Unfortunately, the gene that you heard about earlier, the RAS gene, is one for which there are currently no therapies. But for many of the others shown on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, there are drugs that are either in clinical trials or in a few cases already approved. And although they work temporarily, uh, they do offer a lot of hope for individuals who have those mutations. But we still have about 60% or more of these cancers uh, that uh, are currently not treatable with precision medicine. And for many of the others, we run into the problems of, uh, of drug resistance that makes the, the uh, improvement in a uh, patient's condition short-lived. Now, what I've been telling you in a sense is about the Darwinian situation that afflicts uh, the the, the, the a patient who has uh, a cancer because cancers grow as a result of a sequence of mutations that create a kind of branching pattern that's very similar to what Darwin thought about when he began to envision uh, the, uh, the generation of species in, in uh, his book, The Origin of Species. In fact, this is a picture that comes famously from one of his notebooks where he imagines all the species of animals and plants arising from an early progenitor. And similarly, in cancers, we have an evolutionary process in which mutations are occurring sequentially, conferring new malignant properties on cells or um, converting cells uh, to a drug-resistant state that makes them um, unresponsive to some of the drugs that I illustrated in the previous slide. Now, People like me have still a lot of optimism about using precision medicine uh, to improve the fate of cancer patients. There are other things we also have to keep in mind when we say this. There are lots of ways to, to carry out cancer prevention. We think we could reduce cancer incidence in this country by about 50% if we practiced uh, preventive, uh, preventive medicine more assiduously. Uh, there are screening procedures which are not widely used. There are vaccines against certain uh, against a couple of viruses that are known to cause human cancer, the human papillomavirus, the human hepatitis B virus, um, and we could eliminate 
hepatitis C virus, using new drugs that are now available. Um, but um, we do have to deal with the fact that, we're, that cancer is a persistent uh, outcome of the human condition. I've tried to emphasize that many of the mutations we see are mutations that arise because the copying of DNA and the division of chromosomes into daughter cells is not a perfect process. Indeed, if it was, we never would have evolved into human beings. We, the most primitive forms of life would be all that we had on Earth. So generation of diversity by making mistakes, the duplication of our genes is important for generating diversity of life. But uh, that is also a, uh, a reason why we're always going to be under the, at the risk of having uh, cancers arise because mutations are an inevitable part of being a living species. But there are other ways to under, un, try to overcome some of the frustrations uh, that we're encountering in these early days of precision medicine. One thing that may have occurred to some of you is the idea of using not one drug, but multiple drugs the way we do in the treatment of bacterial infections or the treatment of HIV. Um, that is a, uh, an idea which is being exercised by many people. Um, how to put the right combinations together is still a challenge. How to test those combinations is not easy, but uh, that will, will happen. But there's some other ways to think about this problem. One is to recognize that while cancers are incredibly diverse and, and uh, uh, genetically, that they do carry out a number of common physiological events that have been uh, labeled the hallmarks of cancer. And while I'm not going to take you through all of these, I remind you that, that, uh, that as shown in the blue type near the, near the ring in the center, uh, all cancers uh, have cells that, 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 that grow too often. They, they uh, basically evade growth suppression. Uh, they, they fail to die when they should die. Uh, they, um, they induce blood vessel growth to allow um, uh, blood vessels to supply nutrients and oxygen to the cancer cells. Uh, they show various attributes that, that tend to accelerate the frequency of uh, mutations. And all of these uh, physiological properties of cells can be thought of as targets for various kinds of intervention. And indeed, we do have inhibitors of, uh, of blood, new blood vessel growth. We have inhibitors uh, of uh, DNA repair processes that uh, differentially affect cancer cells. And many of these represent opportunities uh, for, um, for uh, trying to treat cancers in novel ways. One aspect of this story that I want to emphasize is the use, let me just go back for one second, um, is the fact that, that most cancer cells appear to avoid the immune destruction that you might expect to happen if the cells have mutant genes that make abnormal proteins that the immune system should recognize. And over the last decade or so, we've begun to think about ways in which to use the immune system more effectively to protect us against the lethal effects of a cancer. Now, there are many ways in which immunotherapy has come of age in the last decade or so, but I want to spend a few, time, few moments just talking about one of those, and that is the availability of antibodies that, that um, interfere with a mechanism that the body has evolved over the, over the eons to, um, to keep the immune system in check. So the immune system does not respond with, with uh, a deleterious vigor against uh, a, a, a normal uh, constituent of your, of your body. And those so-called checkpoint uh, mechanisms can be interfered with by, a simp by the use of a simple antibody uh, that uh, doesn't need to be tailored to individuals, but can be used uh, more generally in the, in, the, in the cancer population. And the way in which this works is depicted in this cartoon. I don't think we'll have time to go through it in detail, but generally this branch of our immune system called T cells uh, are capable of attacking tumor cells. That attack tends to be modulated by these so-called checkpoint um, components, and antibodies against those checkpoint components, as shown on the right, uh, are able to uh, um, unleash the power of T, cell, uh, T, T cells that are uh, capable of killing tumor cells to uh, cause a, um, uh, a uh, uh, killing of cancer cells in now 
quite a number of uh, cancer types. So we have a lot of recent excitement about this, this so-called checkpoint blockade and uh, these antibodies which, which create that blockade uh, are now um, useful in um, a number of cancer types. Initially, most of the work was done with melanomas, a skin cancer that uh, has a lot of mutations because uh, these cancers arise as a result of UV exposure. Um, it's possible to uh, see effects of these uh, so-called checkpoint blockade antibodies in a number of other cancer types, including some lung cancers, a few colon cancers, kidney cancers, and so forth. It's also been possible to make these antibodies more effective by using them in combination. There are several antibodies now available, uh, and it's also possible to consider combining them with other kinds of cancer therapy, uh, including chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and that's now in process. Uh, to make this kind of therapy more useful, uh, we need to impose the rigors of precision medicine and try to identify what kinds of mutations in cells are creating the foreignness, the antigens that, uh, that the immune system is responding to, and there's a lot of work being done on that. And I would point out there's an irony in all this that uh, while a few minutes ago I was bewailing the complexity of the mutational patterns that we find in cancers, uh, what we have uh, learned is that the best prognostic indicator of a response to these antibodies uh, would be the, the, the mutational burden, the number of mutations actually found in the cancer. So having a lot of mutations means you'll have a lot of new kinds of proteins, some of which, even a single one of which, might be a provocateur to the immune system and help to make the immune system respond, especially once uh, the the uh, checkpoint has been relieved by the use of, uh, of the therapeutic antibodies. The majority of cancer patients are not benefiting from it yet, but it's a hard slog. And uh, I described uh, the use of the drug Gleevec or Matinib as an example of the most promising situation in which matching a drug to a cancer has basically eliminated death from that kind of cancer. Now, that's not the most common cancer in the US by any means, but all of us who have seen um, many patients with inoperable lung cancer respond to um, these targeted drugs for um, several years or more uh, believe that, uh, that there, is a, there is a lot of promise here. Um, these drugs have generally not been used yet in combinations. Uh, we're tampering with the uh, the way in which cancer cells uh, interpret signals um, and cells are crafty. They have ways to get around these drugs by secondary mutations and by rewiring themselves in ways we don't fully understand. So I would say that uh, if in the course of the last 10 years, uh, five or 10% of cancer patients have benefited from the use of these drugs, that's, that's a major step forward. Uh, furthermore, to get into a, another practical issue, um, at the moment, it's my personal belief that every person with a cancer that either has spread beyond the primary site or is likely to should have at least the most common mutations for which we have some actionable step uh, be analyzed to look for these mutations. It will be the case that, uh, that most of those patients will not benefit from the test by having a new drug prescribed, but I also believe that by by doing um, an assessment of the mutational status of every cancer and comparing that status with the treatment that that patient does receive, we'll build a database that we don't currently have that helps to allow doctors to make an assessment of whether a patient might be an exceptional responder to something that he or she happens to receive that works, or whether they're going to have a very short life expectancy or a much longer one. There's information to be gathered, and gathered in a pretty simple and inexpensive way that uh, is not yet being taken advantage of. One of my roles in New York is a, as, um, uh, as a um, member of the staff of the New York Genome Center, and one of the things I hope the Genome Center will be able to do in the near future is to ensure that all patients in New York who have cancers that are potentially lethal um, have these, uh, at least a preliminary um, 
incomplete, but nevertheless very useful genetic analysis of their tumor so we can begin to, uh, to um, associate the new categories we're creating, the new diagnostic categories we're creating with outcomes of different kinds of treatment that currently are being used. One possibility is that people don't have a, a, a very good response to some of these checkpoint inhibitors because they don't have a strong response, T cell response to the antigens in the first place, either because the, the, the antigens that are being responded to, which we believe to be, but haven't really proved to be, the products of genes that have undergone mutations. They may be genes that actually are involved as drivers in the cancer. They may be uh, the products of genes we refer to as passenger genes that aren't contributing to the cancer, uh, the ca cancerous behavior. Um, I think until we know what is being responded to, it's very hard to evaluate that part of it. If that conjecture is correct, though, there's a possibility for um, trying to, in a sense, immunize individuals, make them more responsive while you're also um, relieving the, the, the natural breaks on the immune system. So I, th I think we're just in such an early stage, it's very difficult to say uh, exactly what uh, aspect of the immune system is preventing all patients from responding. Uh, it's incredibly helpful in doing cancer research. Every lab I know uses it, I, my lab uses it, um, because you can modify genes in a very rapid way and begin to understand more profoundly how cancer arises. Um, I just came back from Cold Spring Harbor at a, at a symposium, which I would say half the labs are already using CRISPR-Cas9 as an experimental tool. The idea that we're gonna use uh, CRISPR-Cas9 to uh, treat cancer is highly unlikely, um, just simply because delivery, first of all, it doesn't correct genes very accurately. But more importantly, delivering the, the genetic engineering system to every cell in a cancer, even, even the majority of cells in a cancer is uh, essentially at this point out of the picture. So I think it's, it, it's an incredibly powerful uh, experimental tool, um, but it's not a therapeutic mode at this point. It is potentially useful for, other, for, for treating certain kinds of disorders, and I'm sure you, it's been a major feature of this festival, and I'm sure you've heard uh, examples of diseases in which it is likely to have some utility. Those, in large part, are the same diseases we've been talking about as targets for, other for, for gene therapy of a more conventional sort for many years. And um, I, I, so I, I think the, the, the notion that we're going to use this new editing system as a treatment for cancer is illusory at this point. I want to remind you that uh, that that cancer is uh, a formidable enemy for scientists, for physicians, for the public at large, uh, that uh, the complexity of cancer, now that we can peer into the, the depths of a cancer cell and look at the, the numbers and kinds and, and combinations of, of mutations and other changes in the genome that drive the cancer is really daunting. Um, and I do think it's possible to make a lot of progress by by embracing the complexity, but we also need to think about simpler solutions, which include um, the, the solutions that are conferred by practicing preventive medicine, carrying out the screening procedures we have available, uh, thinking about those individuals who may be at risk as a result of hereditary mutations, and uh, by thinking about novel ways to approach cancer therapy, for example, by trying to interfere with some of the physiological changes that are common to many different kinds of cancers. Thank you, Thank you very much.